Welcome to the uh, Allocators Perspective panel. Uh, I'm Jackie Rosner I'm with Pamco Prisma. Uh, I want to thank VDAC and Barrel Consulting for um, organizing today's great event and for inviting us to be here today. A uh, very exciting uh, bunch of panels this morning, and we're very happy to do this right after lunch, so you're all energized and focused on the content of this panel. And uh, great, so I just want to pass it on uh, first to let the panelists uh, introduce themselves, uh, name their firm and uh, focus, and then we'll uh, jump into uh, the questions. Uh, John, we start with you. Yes, yeah, so I'm John Sargent. I work at Rockefeller Capital Management. We're the family office originally for the Rockefeller family, and now we're a, a wealth manager here in New York City, 45 Rock, and um, we serve ultra high net worth families, endowments, and uh, small institutions. Hi, my name is Scott Weisenbaker. Uh, I'm with Constellation Associates. Uh, we are a single family office uh, for a family that now lives in Puerto Rico. Uh, I'm the CIO, so I get to look at everything, uh, which is fun. Um, and excited to uh, have a good discussion this afternoon. My name's Mylinda Camberry. I work for FIRA Capital, a 160 billion Canadian asset manager. I'm based out of New York, focused on private market solutions. So we provide clients with private credit and, and real assets um, solutions. My name is Neil. Um, I'm on the investment team at Optima Asset Management. Optima is the investment team for uh, the Forbes Stanhope Group. We are a $30 billion multifamily office. I'm Greg Deeds. I work for the Southern Ute Indian Tribe. Uh, it's effectively the sovereign wealth fund. Um, Southern Ute Tribe is based in southwest Colorado. In case you're wondering, Utah is named after the Utes, but most of them are in Colorado. Um, that's where we're located. We look across every asset class um, and, uh, and every liquidity profile. Great. So before we get into the uh, allocator's perspective, as we know what's uh, been going on in markets, this year has been an exciting but challenging year for a lot of uh, alternative and active strategies. It's been quite uh, an equity-led rally from the concentrated and large-cap tech and AI-related firms and most other hedge fund strategies and just other, uh, a lot of other strategies even outside of hedge funds have just uh, struggled and hasn't been anywhere as exciting. We entered this year with a, everyone was uh, quite had a bearish tilt waiting for the long-awaited recession never happened. Uh, right away came, you know, the whole love of uh, AI and uh, people were very excited of where we stood on AI adoption, hence the rally in tech. Um, but then came, you know, the whole period of rates uh, and the worry of being higher for longer. Then that took out a bunch of regional banks in March. Uh, kind of came out of nowhere, uh, kind of surprised the market with a lot of, uh, of what happened. Took out a number of banks and the swift and very surgical policy response that followed. Um, you had this continuous... Um, uh, a bit of a hawkish Fed still, but that didn't uh, turn away, you know, the, the rally in tech. Now we've kind of come to where we are, we think, the end of the hiking cycle. Uh, there still are going to be lingering worries about rates being higher for longer. How much can this tech rally continue? Next year is an election year. There's heightened risks of geopolitical uncertainty. Um, so th there's a lot going on. Uh, so there's a, a, people could think a lot of uh, what happened this year could continue. But then, you know, caution is warranted when you look at uh, in history of all hiking cycles, eventually uh, hiking cycles uh, do get reversed. Um, and you look at every hiking cycle that's happened to date that often led to quite a big slowdown. And uh, what makes this hiking cycle especially interesting was the speed and veracity, how we've, the real rates have just gone from negative 2% to plus 2% so quickly. And uh, it's, already gonna, it's already baked in the cake for what it's gonna be doing for slowing down uh, the economy. So there's a lot to be said about how this potentially can be unwound, you know, coming up in the next year or two, et cetera. So we'd love to hear today from uh, perspectives from various uh, allocators uh, with different uh, expertise and different asset classes and focus. And uh, why don't we start with uh, John, that uh, you have uh, a, quite a broad mandate looking at uh, various asset classes and things. What, are, what excites you today about uh, these markets? Where are you leaning into these days? So I think, you know, 50-50 is the new 60-40. I think um, generational opportunities and fixed income for the first time. I think, irrespective of last week's very significant rally in the bond market, I think there, there are still excellent opportunities in the core fixed income market. So I think that's sort of job number one right now. We, we think the market's about 
10% expensive. I mean, I suppose you get there at 4365 on 220 is 20 times earnings. 4365 on $250 next year is 18 times earnings. So we probably think fair value is around 4000 on the equity market. So I think we're fairly neutral to, to negatively bias on the equity markets. I think in alternatives, I think certainly, um, you know, the Alt Energy Renewable build out, it's $100 trillion going to get spent. And I think in the commodity markets, I think you got to look very deeply right now. And I think we're doing that. Um, the head of the tribe is calling. And um, so I think, you know, for those of us that allocate capital for a living, uh, certainly commodities have always been a conundrum. I think right now they're especially interesting because the ESG crowd really doesn't like, you know, the material side. So I think as that, as that piece gets figured out, particularly in terms of base, base metals, other raw materials, you know, energy, pure energy aside, I think excellent opportunities in the next 10 years. That's a quick summary for me. Uh, Scott, how about yourself? Um, so I'd maybe separate just, I think we're supposed to talk a little bit about alpha and a little bit about markets. Um, you know, on the alpha side, I think one of the things we spend a lot of time thinking about is the size of different opportunity sets versus the amount of capital that is chasing them. Um, and also the potential return and, and return per given unit of risk. And you can define that risk you know, with respect to credit spreads or interest rate duration or private equity multiples or, or PE multiples in public markets. Um, so, you know, I think we start, if we're thinking about alpha at the very top and, and try to look at those things. I'd say with respect to markets, uh, from our perspective, we've been in the higher rates camp for a couple of years and have done a few things that, uh, that Perform very well uh, over the last couple of years to to get ready for this. You know, I, I think from where we are now, uh, one I'd say higher rates is a great thing from uh, an allocator perspective in designing portfolios. You can do things that have been more challenging in the zero interest rate environment. Uh, you can do those now. They can generate stable returns. They can do what fixed income or credit more broadly is trying to do. I'd say, you know, the comment about 50-50 being the new 60-40, I think most portfolios were more like 70-30 or 80-20 going back a couple of years. Um, and now for a number of portfolios, um, you know, we have more than 50% in contractual returns and not just traditional fixed income markets, but things that take advantage of higher rates uh, and our position for the environment that we're living in now. My Linda, with um, so much capital going into uh, private credit, private markets, uh, for so many years of years of low rates, it was really quite the recipient of so much inflows. Um, now that the world has shifted a bit to higher rates, uh, and we saw what you know the effect happened uh, back in March, how it uh, was a bit challenging for uh, regional banks and lending. What makes you excited now in terms of uh, private markets and private credit? Thank you. Um, well, the higher rates still provide really good opportunities for private credit. Um, you know, the banks have retrenched with all the crisis earlier in the year. So we, we are excited about the higher yields generated in private credits, but we're especially excited about asset-backed private credit. So what I mean by asset-backed is we do a lot in real estate loans, whether it's construction financing or bridge financing and infrastructure loans. Um, so in, in, the, in the past 12 months, we've, uh, we've primarily focused on more defensive type of deals on the asset-backed space, less so on the corporate cash flow lending. Uh, we do continue to do corporate cash flow lending. We're very senior in the capital structure, very conservative um, leverage levels. Uh, good, uh, good covenants in place and uh, non-cyclical industries. But on the real estate side, we're focused on multifamily, residential, industrial. And these are not levered. Like what we're doing is actual like construction, like a, a project of uh, 20 townhomes or multifamily. And uh, the, the supply demand dynamics are still very attractive, especially in US and, and across the globe, actually. We do a lot in Canada, UK, New Zealand. Um, 
So with, with all the flight to quality, like these are the, 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 the right places to be. And so there's always demand for homes. And so we're very excited about construction. Um, and we're able to land at very attractive yields. You know, we can get double digits if you include the upfront fees and et cetera with conservative loan to value, 65% loan to value. So it's a, it's a great opportunity set for that. What do you think um, in terms of uh, all the REITs that have to be like refied over the next year and stuff, given that like the small regional banks that control so much of the lending market and uh, more than half of commercial real estate, do you think this um, volatility that might be coming is going to, you know, are you excited about that in terms of the opportunity set? Yes, that will definitely provide a lot of opportunities for those that have dry powder to put to work. Um, uh, so there's, uh, there's, there's, you know, liquidity will, will dry up and has dried up. Um, so it, it depends where you are in terms of uh, available capital to deploy. So with every stress, there's great opportunities. You got to pick the right players and you got to be in the, in the right spots. Great. And Neil, uh, how about yourself? What are you excited about these days? Yeah, um, our group is quite global. We manage uh, money for 100-ish families around the world. Um, so from our seat, we're investing globally across strategies and, and uh, market caps and, 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 and uh, asset classes. And I think from, from a top-down view, one area that I'm particularly excited about is, is biotech. Um, so I was paying close attention to the earlier panel, and I'll take a little bit of a different uh, approach. Um, so, number one, the rolling two-year S&P, I think, is depending on where the market is today, five or six percent down. Um, the rolling XBI, two years down 50. Uh, so, there's a, depending on the day, a roughly 40 to 50 percent spread between the rolling two years between the subset of biotech stocks versus the broader market. Um, and if you start drilling down on what that means, um, one stat that I think is really interesting is that 20% of the S&P's biotech stocks are trading below the amount of cash they have on hand. So I think that that's a really interesting stat because the, the market is effectively not expecting these companies to last for more than a couple of quarters. And for me, that's a particularly uh, perfect environment for active management and stock picking. And I think from an from, uh, um, uh, alpha perspective, uh, you know, the, 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 this particular sector in, in terms of biotech, you know, from just speaking from our perspective, we're investing in, in managers that are practicing doctors, that are seeing patients, that are able to apply what they see in their, their work to the portfolio management. So, I mean, I think that's alpha, that's edge. And, and you know, from the perspective of being a fiduciary and allocator of capital, um, where do I think the opportunities are going to be in the next, you know, few quarters? Things like, you know, we, we touched on before the uh, uh, weight loss drugs, GLP-1s, um, the possibility for the first trillion dollar drug coming out out of those uh, signs. Well, another stat I like pointing out is that the Human Genome Project was 20 years ago. And at that time, it cost $100 million to map one gene, um, one strain. Um, that number is less than $200 today. And to think about the commercial applications in terms of drug discovery and clinical trials and the speed of being able to get drugs to market we saw with the COVID vaccine. You know, with less than one year, we had three, three vaccines come up. So I think from an from a investor's perspective, that's what I'm most excited about from the opportunity to generate returns for my clients. What do you think about, um, you know, that next year being an election year, that it could be, you know, a topic um, uh, could be challenging for things like in healthcare, pharmaceuticals, biotech. Is that uh, potentially could be a headwind, I mean, to the biotech sector? I, you know, I would take the view that it's a tailwind. I think it's a tailwind for active management because if you, if you drill down to these companies, it's really going to, like, think of it, uh, there's, you know, uh, for, each, for each public company, there's five important C-level roles. So every single year, you know, X percent are coming onto the market. And these are jobs that are getting filled by people who maybe are not qualified to do these jobs from a fundamental perspective. So I think it's, it's the perfect environment to be able to, to do your diligence, to do your homework, and be in a position to, to, to go long short some of, these, some of these options. It's also interesting in the biotech sector, it's a set, sector that's very sensitive to interest rates. And you look at this year, even though rates backed up a lot during the year, uh, real rates, you know, I mean, 10-year yields started the year around 385. It almost touched 5%. Uh, 
but that didn't hurt things like uh, NASDAQ and large cap tech, but other interest rate sensitive things like biotech, utilities really went down a lot. Now we saw what happened last week as uh, bonds rallied considerably. Uh, could this, is it, um, how much of a view do you think one needs to have on rates to be, uh, to lean into in favor of biotech? You know, I, for this sector, we don't think about rates too much. I, I think it's, you know, one, one thing that's interesting is that the, I think the S, healthcare is like 15% of the S&P and biotech is a tiny percentage of that. So what, what that means is that the large mutual funds, the big dollar investors don't feel they need positions in the space. So those companies that seven, 800 public companies don't get institutional capital that they would otherwise. And, that, and I think that that definitely depresses prices and they don't get this rising tide fits all boats type uh, effect that other stocks might. It's very interesting. As you pointed out, it's um, given how much biotech as a sector is retrenched, it's quite a, a bit of a contrarian a view, but one, if you have a little bit slightly longer perspective, it looks like uh, something very exciting. Uh, Greg, uh, how about yourself? What uh, excites you and what are you leaning into these days? Sure, absolutely. And I'm hoping Neil's right on biotech because we uh, went contrarian a little bit earlier and um, have gotten our teeth kicked in on that. So I'm hoping that he's right on that. Uh, places where we've been spending time uh, over the last year, I, we, we definitely, um, to Scott's point, we, we like to look at things that are um, – Either capital constrained, people won't look at them for um, for behavioral finance reasons, uh, and also liquidity has come out of the market. Um, we like to look at things like that. So if we we've added some capital to the energy space, uh, both in uh, traditional oil and gas uh, because we feel it's under. Uh, allocated to at this point because there's lots of folks that will not go there. Uh, the, the tribes endowment originally came from natural gas, so we don't have that same aversion. That said, we've also tried to take advantage of the IRA. We did a carbon capture sequestration project. Uh, we, we also like to look at things, uh, especially in credit now, we are tilting a little bit more towards credit, a little more away from equity. And that's really just a base rates thing, uh, you know, having real rates positive for the first time in a very long time, even though headline spreads don't look that great. Uh, if we can get double digit returns out of credit, what we think is actually credit and not equity and drag, then that's attractive for us. So we've done, uh, in addition to other areas that we think have been capital constrained, for example, reinsurance is something where people um, sort of like what happened to us, but for a much longer period of time, uh, have gotten their teeth kicked in that they, you know, that repriced dramatically uh, this year. So, so that's the place where we've added capital. And then we've done things like mortgage servicing rights, uh, which if you want to learn more about, talk to Scott, he understands it much better than I do. But it's a, uh, you know, a play on higher for longer. Uh, and also we think it's uh, the base case returns are interesting. And it also is, is a nice portfolio complement. So those are some of the things that we're looking at in addition to just, as I said, run of the mill. We haven't figured out exactly where we want to spend the extra credit dollars. Uh, we're going to be looking across asset back, real estate, probably some more cash flow lending. Um, and potentially, if we had a distress cycle, not sure exactly where the distress is going to come from, it may end up being on the LP side. So we would like to have a little bit of capital uh, to potentially buy things in the secondary market. Uh, when you say you like energy and leaning into the energy sector, and you also talked about how you like uh, credit over equities, yeah. but what in what format um, are you leaning into energy? Is it uh, like external allocations to uh, hedge fund managers? Is it uh, energy credit related? It's more uh, it's more um, private equity investments uh, and you know in operating in, uh, operating properties. So we talked about, uh, we had an interesting perspective and mix about what our panelists are leaning into. Now I'm kind of curious, uh, shifting it to the other side, um, what are we avoiding? What is it we don't like? What are we worried about? Um, and what are we underweighting these days? So John, why don't you kick us off on that topic? Well, I, I think the low interest rate environment was very favorable for, for private equity, um, both in terms of buyouts and mid-market private equity. Because you think about it, that's in an intrinsically a levered asset class. So. I think in terms of locking up capital for four, six, eight, 10, 12 years right now in private equity, I think it's, it better be a top quartile manager with a specialization that aligns with, with your own interest and objectives. So I think private equity is probably going to be more challenged. I think, you know, it's, it's equity markets on, on steroids. You know, hedge funds have been a diff, really a difficult 10-year period, if you think about it, whether you look at the HFR index, which has a lot of survivorship bias, but 
in general, even the, even the brand name hedge funds with excellent managers have struggled. COVID was a doozy. Low interest rates, frankly, were a doozy. And I think, you know, kind of breaking hedge funds down, you know, they're not really negatively correlated to equity markets, I think. You know, there's some, some are market neutral, I suppose. Uh, but really, they're, they're negatively correlated to duration, which I think is something, which is a sort of a concept and allocation that, that probably deserves to be explored a little more. <clears throat> so if you think about that right now, after we've had this, you know, sort of 350, point, 350 basis point move, you know, where does that, where does that leave kind of hedge funds as an asset class? Now, you know, within hedge funds, there's so many sub-asset classes, and the quants have really, you know, done a great job principally in the last, you know, kind of 15 years. So, but I'd say in general, we're, we're underweight private equity, underweight hedge funds for those reasons. I mean, to be devil's advocate, talking about uh, the hedge fund, uh, there's some panels that are here be happening later in the afternoon about the hedge fund conundrum. But the question is, yeah, why are people interested in an asset class that year to date is up maybe five, six percent when it's pretty much where cash rates are? Um, so, yeah, it is a challenge. Well, I, I think the reason investors like hedge funds is, is the risk management is typically very, very good, if not outstanding. And a few names come to mind, you know, we won't dig into them, that have just knocked it out of the park with, with risk management. I think a lot of people in this room, you know, have, have been a part of that in terms of providing tools to hedge funds, you know, that allow them to risk manage in a, in a constructive way. And I think particularly if you advise into the high net worth space, you know, you, you face this concept they call statement risk, and, the, and clients just don't want assets going down. Now, they can live with equity volatility because I think most investors understand what that is. But hedge funds, you know, if it promises X and it delivers Y, there's that, that basic disconnect. And the good ones have managed risk well. And I think they'll continue to manage risk well. And, uh, and I think the, the tools in the toolkit are getting better for risk management. So that's the, that's the silver lining here on the hedge fund business. That definitely is the hedge fund proposition, definitely as a diversifier and for capital preservation. And uh, as people get more and more concerned about being in long only, uh, both in equities and fixed income. So that's for sure. Uh, Scott, how about yourself? What is it that uh, we're avoiding these days? What do you think should be underweight? Uh, you know, I, I, would, I would definitely agree on the PE side. You know, I think equity markets, broadly speaking, um, and markets in general, people have gotten very used to interest rates that, have, you know, if you look at a very long time horizon, have done nothing but go down. Many investors, that's all they've ever seen. And in the last 18 months, you know, that's changed. And I think that really has a big implication on what you're going to do and what makes sense. Um, large cap, private equity, like I, I would totally agree. Multiples haven't moved much. Your interest costs are higher. You could have wage pressures. Like, so many of the drivers to generating returns are in your face as opposed to being a tailwind. Um, we're not focused there. Um, you know, I, I would say with respect to diversifying assets, whether it's hedge fund or credit, um, we have leaned more into credit than hedge funds. I think um, hedge funds were a big part of our portfolio a number of years ago, but combination of lower dispersion and the equity-based strategies and tax inefficiencies um, were challenges, particularly before the family moved to Puerto Rico. Um, we have a little less tax sensitivity there now, but there's, there's still hesitation about paying lots of fees and locking up capital uh, to generate returns that aren't outsized versus things that we can understand fundamentally and, and, and get our arms around. So, you know, I would say things we're underweighting, equities, broadly speaking, uh, large cap private equity buyout in particular. Uh, I do think there are some opportunities that low end of the private equity market if you can buy at very low multiples in defense of businesses and do add-ons. Um, but I feel a lot better paying a 5 PE than a 8, 10, 12, 14 plus PE. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot to do on credit, but you got to be thoughtful about the world we're living in and the drivers of return um, to find the right, right spots. A uh, five PE sounds a lot better than uh, uh, large cap, uh, large cap tech trading at a forty-five PE, but and no dividends. Yeah, you know. tech's a whole different story. And you, by the way, we're huge fans of tech. It's the biggest allocation we have. Um, it's the reason that 
the family moved from Florida to Puerto Rico. Um, so we love TAC, um, but we're not adding as much there as we are to other spots. You know, it's interesting already, uh, so far two panelists raise issues about um, uh, caution warranted with the equity rally. Uh, and so much has changed just even the last week alone when you look at uh, the resiliency in the markets uh, softer data, uh, slowing growth, saying that the hiking cycle, you know, has been effect, and uh, the Fed telegraphing that uh, the market taking pricing out no more hikes right now. Um, the refunding announcement was a lot less uh, onerous than people thought. Bank of Japan was a lot less aggressive than people thought. Positioning lightened up so much that now you have this like risk on rally. Uh, technically bounced off long term averages. Uh, the technical crowd likes it. People focusing on the seasonals into a year end rally. So, you know, the question is, um, you know, how much more can this party uh, continue, even though caution is warranted? But it seems that, you know, with, with rates rallying as much as it did, like 50 bips in the last uh, 10 days, you know, maybe this, uh, the party can continue uh, for quite but, longer. But notwithstanding the recent rally, which actually makes the math even worse, you know, traditionally, if you look at the last 50 years of history, you're supposed to get paid an equity risk premium to own equities which are more volatile than you are for risk-free assets. Right now, if you look at the inverse of your PE, your earning yields on the S&P 500 is something like 50 basis points below the 10-year Treasury rate. You know, the long-term average over the last 50 years is something like 27 basis points. If that reverts, equity markets will be down 15%. And if you look at the equity risk premium during periods where rates are increasing, it looks more like 225 basis points, which implies equities are 40% overvalued. I, I, I'm not in the camp that things are gonna crash tomorrow, but I do think you could see a sustained period where credit and contractual returns outperform equities, whether that's because equities are flat or they go down some. Um, you know, We can all talk about what could happen, but you know, that, that's, you know, math over very long periods of time. And I, I do think people are really underestimating the tailwind that we've all had from declining discount rates on risk assets over the last 40 plus years. Yeah, that's an important observation that people um, uh, seem to forget when they see that the things like the NASDAQ has such limited drawdowns and it's uh, behaving like a treasury bill in terms of drawdowns. It's Did, easy to forget I, what I happens I think in, in 2001, there was a pretty big drawdown in the NASDAQ. <laughs> exactly. My Linda, how about yourself? What areas are you underweighting or you think um, that you're avoiding? Yeah, I mean, with a backdrop of higher rates for longer, elevated inflation, high, uh, uh, volatility, we wanna be conservative, we wanna be defensive. So we want to be high in the capital structure um, on, the, on the credit side and uh, on the equity side, we're investing in real assets, which are inflation hedged. Um, in terms of the corporates, I mean, there has been a lot of inflow into the private credit space, but it's all grown after the financial crisis. So we haven't really seen a, a distress cycle in the private credit side. And we expect that the default rates will pick up Companies are already starting to see um, pressure on the margins and the EBITDA uh, breaching covenants. So we're going to see more and more of that. So it's important to be with companies that are non-cyclical that can withstand this this market cycle. Uh, but will we see blood? We will see blood. Um, and so that's why it's very important to stay high in the capital structure. Good quality companies. You don't need to go. You know to take a lot of risk to generate. Good, good returns today. Uh, and I mentioned real estate backed. We, that's, that's our sweet spot. Over 70% of our private credit portfolio is in real estate assets. And so there we're avoiding office and retail. We're primarily focused on multifamily and, uh, and industrial. But in, in real estate, there's three, um, character, three items that are critical. It's location, location, and location. So at the end of the day, you know, where is this real estate asset? Will it always have demand? Even if it's an office space, there's some office spaces that are, you know, the occupancy rate has come back to pre-COVID crisis levels, whereas others are just empty. There's office space that are high rise, harder to, to lease, and there's others that are walk-ups, uh, suburban, uh, with ability to even transition them into ind industrial or multifamily. So it's all about location and, and supply demand. 
On the real asset side, um, on the equity, so we do also equity investments on real assets. Uh, what we do there is real estate, infrastructure, agriculture, and timberland. Uh, what we like about these assets in, in the current market environment, especially with the inflation and, and uh, cap rates rising or discount rates rising, is that they provide the inflation hatch. So the cost basis is increasing, whether it's um, cost of leverage, labor, supplies. But at the same time, uh, these assets are raising the revenue side. So on the real estate side, we're renewing rents at a higher level. So the cap rate increase is causing valuations to come down. But at the same time, the higher rents are causing valuations to go up. So um, when you know, it's all about leverage at the end of the day. So if you're not levered on these real estate assets, they're, with, with, they're holding really well, especially in Canada. We've, we've seen quite, quite a bit of stability, whereas in US, we've seen quite a, a drag in real estate assets. On the infrastructure side, take an example of ferry business. Labor costs have gone up, oil costs has gone up, but at the same time, the ticket prices are going up, so that's offsetting the, the cost. On the agricultural side, uh, the labor is, is, is gone up. We're putting uh, more resources into making more efficient uh, technology to, to, to generate produce, but at the same time, like the, the cherry prices have gone up. So those are the assets that we like. We try to be conservative and uh, and withstand this the cycle. Thank you, Melinda and Neil. How about yourself? What areas are you underweighting? Um, I, I agree with uh, Scott and John, such that you know private equity at this stage maybe not so attractive, particularly you know from a valuation perspective. Um, very liquidity conscious, uh, we are as well. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll add an anecdote. Um, probably from 2014 to 2018. I personally, I was going to, to Hong Kong, to Singapore once a quarter or more. Um, there was significant demand for us to deploy assets there, significant demand for us to diligence deals over there. And then since then, it's, it's zero. Um, so, you know, for, for what it's worth, there's not a whole lot of interest um, that I've seen for other folks or institutional investors to, to allocate over there. It's amazing what a 5% risk-free rate will do, huh? <laughs> Greg, and your thoughts? Sorry. Thank you. Um, we're going last. You can kind of echo everybody, I guess. Uh, we are. We will definitely be taking some money away from from equity uh, allocations, uh, both on the on the public side and, and probably reduce commitments on the private equity side, uh, for the reasons that we touched on before. Quite simply, if we can get the returns we're looking for out of fixed income, why not? Uh, we don't need to take the extra risk to uh, to try and generate the the higher returns. Uh, we'd rather forego that uh, to to get ourselves what we think can be you know low double digit returns in many cases or or high single digit with very low risk. Uh, if we can do that, that fits. Uh, that primarily will be coming from the equity. It may end up coming a little bit from some of uh, the hedge fund strategies that I would describe as bond replacement strategies that have generated sort of four to five over the last handful full of years when risk-free rate was zero that actually wasn't so bad but if they if they only go to seven or eight uh then all of a sudden you're you know it doesn't look so good so i think that those will be the two areas where we pull capital from to deploy uh predominantly to to credit and and to your point one of the reasons we have an energy allocation um i point on on things that are uh inflation linked that's why we have a real assets allocation and and sim and we also like the fact that there are other folks that won't touch it for for esg reasons which is you know perfectly valid but it just means that there's we think there's a capital hole and we think that these assets are going to be used in our um you know in our economy for uh for longer than i'm going to be working great i'd like to um Thank our panelists. That concludes our panel with great, interesting perspectives on alpha opportunities ahead. And I was just thinking, Donald Trump is in Manhattan today, and if Donald Trump were here at Barrel Elites, he would also thank the tens of thousands of people in the audience today. <laughs> so, and he would also say that the Barrel Elites conference is huge and is probably the greatest of greatest hedge He'd fund conferences Jack, ever. He'd say, Jackie, you're a tall guy. He'd say, <laughs> exactly. Jackie, you're so tall. <laughs> exactly. So I want to thank everyone. Thank you, Vidak, and thank you, Barrel Elites. Thank you.